Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Dukas, and I direct the program in Medical Ethics and Human Values here at Tulane University. And you are here to uh, attend the J.R. Williams Senior Class of 31 Endowed Lecture, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, His Life, Work, and Relevance to Bioethics by Dr. Mary Lynn Dell. Before we do that, I'd like to go ahead and present some background on the J.R. Williams Fund because the family has been so gracious to uh, create this endowment during the last two decades. It was initiated in the fall of 2013. The endowment specifically supports lectures in spirituality and health, focusing on the art of creating a compassionate and trusting relationship between patient and doctor. The series honors the legacy of J. Richard Williams, a Tulane University School of Medicine graduate who is a well-known and well-loved internist and oncologist in Selma, Alabama. And Dr. Williams was known as a physician who loved medicine and was the kind of doctor who would do anything for his patient. He specifically had an interest in the impact of spirituality on health. You have to remember during the, the mid 20th century, much of oncology, unfortunately, was palliative care rather than curative, particularly on the positive impact of spirituality on the well being and continued health of those who have suffered the loss of a loved one. I'm now going to turn this next couple of slides over to Dr. Stephen Hansen. He will talk on the Master of Science in bioethics and medical humanities. Thank you, David. Uh, I will not take much of your time. We, the, the Master of Science in Bioethics and Medical Humanities is a co-sponsor of this talk, and I'm very uh, happy to be able to tell you just a little bit about us. But if you want to know more about us, we are easily available to lane.edu slash bioethics. Uh, you can see many of these prior talks uh, and other things that we've done on YouTube. Um, just search for Tulane Bioethics. And so it, I'll talk a little bit, but that's if, how you can find out more. Next slide, please. So we have a master's program where we study two different tracks, both bioethics and medical humanities. Uh, and you would focus on either the bioethics track or the medical humanities track, although in either case, you would end up taking some from both disciplines. We have a bioethics track that focuses primarily on training in teaching, research, and, and uh, uh, service around the ethics that are relevant in the clinical setting, especially so hospital ethics committee, institutional review board service, or teaching in any healthcare setting, whether it be a hospital, a medical school, or elsewhere. Uh, and of course, conducting research, either normative or empirical in bioethics. The medical humanities track um, trains more in the art of knowing, uh, teaching and research on the issues where the humanities and medicine intersect. So talking about narrative, history, uh, literature, uh, film, uh, and the both the impact that this has on medicine, the impact medicine has on them, and also the way that they allow us to understand the practice of medicine as not merely a scientific thing, but in fact, something that is richly humanistic. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we have a wide variety of ways that you can study with us. The program is offered in a traditional two-year format. We have an accelerated one-year format. At the end of either of those, you would end up with the Master of Science in Bioethics and Medical Humanities. For students who are interested in dual degree, medical school and, and uh, an MS, we have that option to the School of Medicine and it takes no extra time. It's still the four years through medical school uh, will be no extra time to achieve both the MD and the MS at the end of those four years. Um, we also can, um, in addition to the first, the, 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 the one year and the two year program, we also have a part time availability so that people can take more than two years if people are coming in as a practicing professional and want to get the master's degree. And if you don't want a full master's degree, but you still want some training, we have graduate certificates. We have one in clinical ethics, one in research ethics, and one in medical humanities. Conversely, if you take a certificate and you find that's really whetted your appetite, you can build on the certificates to take the, those credits and turn them into a master's degree with just a few more classes. Next slide, please. 
Uh, like I said, I don't want to take up any more of Dr. Dell's time. Uh, here is, uh, you know, if you want to take a quick shot of the QR code, um, that's that'll take you directly to us. Or if you don't have your camera ready to do that or not ready to do it now, just remember, Tulane.edu Bioethics is us. Uh, and of course, you can also contact me or Dr. Ofengenden. Uh, we are both, you know, work, work to help direct the program. And we will be glad to answer any questions that you might have about our Master of Science program. David, please take it away. There we go. So I will be doing the introduction of Dr. Dell right now. Uh, Mary, I'm going to stop sharing so you can put your own PowerPoint up while I introduce you. Dr. Mary Lynn Dell, who's got both an MD and a doctorate in uh, ministry, is currently an adjunct professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences and instructor in pediatrics at Tulane University. An ordained Episcopal tree, a priest, she currently chairs the APA Caucus on Religion, Spirituality, and Psychiatry, co-chairs the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Ethics Committee, and was the founding chair of the AACAP Committee on Religion and Spirituality. She graduated from the Indiana University School of Medicine, where she also completed a general psychiatric residency, then completed a child and adolescent psychiatry fellowship at Emory, a research fellowship at NIMH, and served on faculties at Emory, Penn, George Washington, Case Western, and Ohio State University. She maintains ABPN certification in general, child and adolescent, consultation liaison, and forensic psychiatry. Dr. Dell's theological education was received at Emory's Candler School of Theology, the Virginia Theological Seminary, and Columbia Theological Seminary. Her clinical and academic interests also include chronic and life-limiting medical illnesses in children, adolescents, and transitional age individuals, psychiatric care of adults living with historically pediatric conditions, cystic fibrosis, epilepsy, and other neurological conditions, medical comorbidities and autism across the lifespan, bioethics, and medical education. <clears throat> Dr. Dell will be leaving New Orleans in mid-September to accept the position of Chief of Child and Family Psychiatry and Professor of Psychiatry, Neurobehavioral Science and Pediatrics at my alma mater, the University of Virginia and the UVA Medical Center in Charlottesville. I'm also told to remind you all that for MDs, RNs, et cetera, for CME, please go to the chat and put in your name and your email. So I am very uh, proud to present to you, Dr. Mary Dell. Mary? Thank you very much for, um, for that kind introduction. And uh, I especially uh, want to <laughs> thank not only the program in medical ethics and uh, human values, uh, but also the Williams family for their visionary support of opportunities like these. So I'm going to uh, try something that's uh, a little new um, from my part, but that I've been doing the thinking about. Uh, and that is to think about the work of Archbishop Desmond Tutu and its relevance to bioethics. So uh, as a uh, psychiatrist especially, um, we uh, pay close attention to disclosures. I think most of them have been given. Uh, they are listed on the, on the slide there. So uh, Archbishop Tutu was born in 1931, and as most of you may remember, he died the day after Christmas in 2021, so only about nine months ago. And uh, to the right is one of my favorite uh, pictures of him, where he looks um, dignified 
um, appropriately dignified, but you can see that smile. So my, here's where my interest began uh, with uh, his work and his theology. I want to take you to Alexandria, Virginia in January of 2004. Um, my husband and I were living in Alexandria from about 1999 to 2005. Uh, we were newlyweds and our first, uh, both of our children were born there. During that time, uh, a relatively large um, membership congregation, some of you might actually recognize this building. This is Christ Church in Alexandria, Virginia. And uh, it's an Episcopal church, part of the Anglican tradition. Uh, we were married there. We attended there. We're active there. And uh, I actually was volunteer clergy there during our, our time in Alexandria. During that time, uh, the collective we at the church on staff uh, received uh, funding from the Lilly Foundation and I was uh, privileged to help out the, in the development of it, essentially a two-year residency program for relatively new graduates of theological seminaries. And uh, where they would, for the first two years after um, graduation from seminary, uh, they would rotate through the different departments of this congregation. So there would be one on worship, one on administration, education, community involvement and liaison, you, you get the picture. It was uh, actually kind of fun for me to put that together. Uh, a, a large part of it was transposing the parts that really work well of the medical education model, postgraduate medical education model into that practical theological framework. And by the way, one of, let me um, say this. I meant to say this earlier. Um, the other part of disclosure that's important for this is that I grew up in a conservative Protestant family. I am now uh, an ordained Episcopal uh, priest. This talk is about Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who, uh, as you're aware, uh, was um, uh, from in the Anglican tradition. So while those are our background from the Judeo-Christian background, the, the, um, the spirit of this talk um, and the whole premise that there's application to bioethics is because of shared values, um, shared ethics uh, among all major world faith traditions. There's a corpus of values that are principally shared. And then also um, a, a, a corpus of virtue ethics that even in secular traditions or by folks who do not ascribe to a particular um, world faith tradition or even believe in God, that there are shared values that uh, humans and humans who care for other humans uh, normally um, subscribe to. So um, back to Christchurch, as part of this program, uh, the first few years, the first round, there were four individuals who were in, in, enrolled in this. And these were seminary graduates of different ages, most of them second career. And one of them was Umpa Tutu, uh, Archbishop Tutu's uh, fourth uh, child has one son and three daughters, and actually the three women are all Anglican uh, priests. So Umpa and I, we became uh, friends as uh, uh, everyone was within this program. Uh, for those of you familiar with the Anglican um, uh, Church, what you may know that is that uh, there's uh, for the most part, kind of a typical progression uh, in that you graduate from seminary, you get the, the theological education, and then there is an ordination, ordination meaning a service, uh, a process whereby those that you serve in the congregation honor, recognize 
um, your um, the start of your your service and ministry. Uh, so there's an ordination to the diac. Well, it's called the transitional diaconate. This followed six months or more soon thereafter to um, ordination for full to full priesthood. And so lo and behold, um, and this, by the way, is the inside of this particular congregation. This plays a role in a minute. Um, on January 17th, 2004, uh, all four people in this program uh, were scheduled here at there at Christ Church for ordination to the priesthood. And when one of their fathers is Archbishop Desmond Tutu, um, that means that he gets invited to be one of the chief uh, uh, presiding um, officials. So in the spirit or, or during that service, it's traditional for the presiding official, and that was uh, 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 Archbishop Tudu, to have what's called a chaplain. And basically that just means an ordained priest that holds his Bible, holds all the bulletins, holds his notes. And in his case, as being a very emotive man, um, a whole lot of handkerchiefs. and you uh, follow him all the way up and down. What you uh, may not be able to appreciate is there's a lot of stairs there and uh, a, a lot of uh, a lot of places. And uh, Archbishop Tutu, um, th that man could really move. He scurried all the way around, bopped up and down. Uh, it was very interesting. Well, I was designated to be his chaplain. Uh, one of the reasons being that, that they said I was used to managing emer emergencies in the emergency room. And so if things blew off um, off the altar or other crises happened up there, they thought that I might be able to keep a straight face and handle it. Well, that was all well and good. Then about seven to 10 days before this um, event, uh, our son, who was uh, 11 months old at the time, became very, very ill and was hospitalized. I, um, this uh, rehearsal for this service was um, uh, the evening before uh, he was to be discharged. And um, there was no way I was gonna go and leave him in the hospital, uh, but he was doing so much better. Um, we had confidence. Uh, in the team. Um, actually, he was ready to, to be discharged. Um, uh, but basically, um, uh, you know, my husband and uh, kicked me out, said, no, hospital's closed. You know, you've got your pager, da, da, da. Um, this is a once in a lifetime thing. You uh, go. So um, I did with a lot of misgivings. During that rehearsal, as I was holding things for him, um, Archbishop Tutu noticed that I had the wristband on. And so all the way through that rehearsal, when we were supposed to be paying attention, I thought um, he was talking uh, uh, through out the sides of his mouth, wanting to know all about our son, what was wrong with him, um, and uh, uh, giving, uh, inquiring about how I was doing, how I was handling the hospitalization, being both a physician um, and the mother. And it was just an amazing experience. Um, here, um, uh, I actually just found these last week. What you see here on the left is a picture of Umpa blessing her father. Uh, this was immediately after um, the ordination um, was uh, completed. And then over here on the right, uh, you can probably, um, I'm standing there beside um, Archbishop Tutu, and you can see that uh, wristband. Uh, and um, he picked up on that. Uh, very observant, and you can see Umpa kneeling um, right there in front of us. So with Archbishop Tutu's death last Christmas, um, this experience that I had with him 
um, has has of course remained in my mind, and um, it's one of those things that I really wanted to reflect on. But you know, you get busy and don't have have the time, and so I'm grateful um, for the invitation um, to be here because the preparing this has has uh, let me do some reflection on that experience. But in the context of being a physician, a mentor, a teacher, and a perpetual student um, uh, trying to improve patient care. So uh, I put together some significant dates in, um, uh, actually in, um, in South Africa, they call them the arch. Um, but in terms of Tutu's life, he was born in 1931. He actually came from a relatively poor family. Both his parents were teachers, but um, that did not bring in uh, much money. Uh, he had two older sisters, and he also had an, uh, an older brother, but the uh, older brother um, is deceased. Um, his adolescence, childhood and adolescence, was affected by a few things. He was hospitalized for 20 months with tuberculosis, and he actually contracted polio before that and was in an accident where he received some burns. Um, he was accepted, believe it or not, to medical school. That was his first choice for a career, but could not afford the tuition, so he went into teaching. He earned, uh, he, he worked constantly, um, a number of jobs. He was even a choir master at one point in time. Um, he um, uh, received his seminary education, so I said, um, living a period of time in London after his marriage. His children were born during that time, or at least most of them were born during that time. He came back to South Africa and uh, not, was teaching uh, pretty regularly at various seminaries, um, but then was called back um, by the Theological Education Fund, which was an arm of the um, um, uh, World Council of Churches, and worked in London, um, and then went back to South Africa, where he rose very quickly through the leadership ranks of the um, Anglican arm um, of the Anglican the arm of the Anglican Church in South Africa. Notice in 1979 he received an honorary degree from Harvard, and throughout this time uh, was when he was engaging in his community work, his uh, boots on the ground experiences of being in the villages, being you know, uh, uh, bringing. Um, rest um, uh, leadership to uh, various uh, uh, uprisings, various, or he didn't lead the uprisings, but he would go and minister to areas, to towns, uh, to far reaches in Africa and other parts of the world that were experiencing un unrest and uh, various forms of persecution. Um, in 1984, uh, he happened to be in the United States um, uh, lecturing at General Theological Seminary in New York when he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, which, of course, he gave that money right back and invested it into scholarship money. Um, the other work that he's known for is that he headed the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, in 1995 being a significant year as he was diagnosed with prostate cancer. And uh, he actually spent several of those years in Atlanta. A couple of his children lived in Atlanta and he was at Emory. Um, then um, when um, uh, in the, over the last 20 years, he says he kept trying to retire from public life, but much of the corpus of his work that we have to refer to now, um, the traveling, the speaking, the writing, the awards, uh, came in the last 20 years. And he also had uh, ex, um, uh, what he considered to be ministries, his expressions, his thoughts, his his pastoral guidance on all kinds of issues, um, many of which um, have their parallels in bioethics, uh, such as the role of women in professions, LBGTQ, uh, the HIV AIDS pandemic, child trafficking, 
legalized assisted dying, which he was in favor of. He was one of the first to speak on climate change and uh, also was involved with some uh, COVID-19 work prior to his death the day after this past Christmas. So what was he like? Well, even in the 36 hours that I was in contact with him, um, I found these words, and you'll find these words throughout all the writings and all the acknowledgments um, of everyone that really knew him and worked with him and were mentored with him. He loved, he prayed. Um, I have a story for another time about his prayer before the ordination service on the 17th of January, 2004. He was joyful, he laughed. He was common. And indeed, that's one, um, I think, of the keys of the, the power, the transcendence of um, his work and why it uh, is been embraced by uh, people of all faith traditions and even those who do not consider themselves to be religious or spiritual. Uh, he was intellectually gifted. He was interested in everyone. During that time that we were kind of bopping up and down uh, across the uh, front of the sanctuary at that rehearsal, he was asking everything about my son. And he said, well, what's wrong with him? What symptoms do he have? Why did you take him to the emergency room? And he said, oh, he was limp. What was his, what was his blood sugar? And I said, it was 26. And he looked at me like, oh, how can you live with 26? Um, he wanted to know, well, what caused it? And I said, well, we find out, found out that he had a virus. What virus? And so the, these were the whispers that were going on in between, you know, when we were supposed to, I thought, paying attention. Um, uh, but um, uh, after all, if Desmond Tutu is talking to you, you need to answer his questions. Um, but he was just very, very intellectually curious. He worked hard. Now, he also had a sharp tongue, um, which he used fairly judiciously. Um, he spoke as he believed that he was called to do, but he was rooted in his faith and beliefs. And I think when you consider individuals, uh, whether it be like, El I was think, trying to think of others, um, the Dalai Lama, um, Eli Wazel, um, other leaders of universal proportions, um, one of the reasons that they can and do speak to so many people uh, worldwide is because they are so rooted and so connected uh, from their uh, in their own original uh, faith tradition, their own original community and belief system. So, of course, uh, when people think of Desmond Tutu, then it's natural to think about his contributions, especially in the political arena, uh, or they are manifested in the political and international arena on diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. And again, what's universal in everything that Tudu said and wrote and what people say about him is that he, in and of himself, was basically apolitical. He did. He was not a politician. He didn't want to run for office. He came from a place within his faith. And when he saw incidents, people, problems, issues around him and in his world that he felt directed by God, his God to address, he did. If they happen, if that happened to be in the political realm, fine. If it happened to be in education, that's okay. If it happened to be in a, in a family situation or within the churches he pastored, he spoke where he was called. Uh, one of his... Um, uh, disciples, uh, and actually Wilma Jacobson was the first Anglican woman ordained by Tutu. Uh, so Desmond Tutu has always and is still always unequivocally clear about faith and justice and equality and inclusion, that God is not a man. God is not homophobic. God is not a Christian. 
And all human beings, all people, all, all, all are made in the image of God. And again, in that observation, which actually is a paraphrase of um, many things that, that Tutu himself said, um, you see that his inclusion and his um, views on equity are, are rooted in that, that everyone is equal, that there is not a hierarchy based on gender, based on religion, based on anything else. All human beings are equal. And in Tutu's thinking, his belief system, because he was a Christian and Anglican, people are human because they are made in the image of God. We live in a universe marked by diversity as the law of its being and our being. We are made to exist in a life that should be marked by cooperation, interdependence, sharing, caring, compassion, and complementarity. We should celebrate our diversity. We should exult in our differences as making not for separation and alienation and hospitality, but for their glorious opposites. The law of our being is to live in solidarity, friendship, helpfulness, unselfishness, interdependence, and complementarity as sisters and brothers in one family, the human family, God's family. Anything else, as we have experienced, is disaster. So while on the one hand, this seems like a rather um, loft, this seems like lofty content to the quote, um, this uh, really is the basis of the 2-2 ethic for addressing uh, the issues of, uh, of DEI and justice in each and every discipline in each and every setting. Within this, you see um, many of the principles that at least us as, as educators, for instance, uh, when we are first introducing the idea of principles, of virtue ethics, of um, the ethics of caring to our students, and when uh, we think through uh, approaches and mindsets to problems and to issues that come up in a clinical setting, um, this is very compatible with many of the accepted approaches, the common approaches, that most of us do take um, to uh, into the uh, clinical bioethics realm. So um, again, uh, there are some people that uh, transcend faith traditions. And what's interesting is that uh, Tutu and the Dalai Lama, they were best buddies. And uh, they're numerous pictures of their many encounters over the years. And uh, there you see Tutu, one of the many pictures of captured of him literally dancing in his seat, a uh, very joyful man. Um, one of the issues um, close to his heart um, was the, uh, the, um, the Holocaust and indeed uh, Middle Eastern relations forward. Uh, here's another former Nobel Peace Prize, Jimmy Carter, uh, with um, Archbishop Tutu in Jerusalem. And what you see at the bottom of the screen there are um, le raised letters um, that come from uh, two of the uh, uh, concentration uh, camps uh, where many Jews and other marginalized individuals perished um, in the 1940s. And here's another, uh, another uh, quote um, from an address that Tutu gave at the United Nations World Conference Against Racism. And uh, I want to point out something in the second paragraph. So, you know, he, he gives this first paragraph, which is another Magnus, uh, you know, uh, Tutu-esque um, uh, statement about the ills of racism and what it does to the human spirit. 
But in the second paragraph here, uh, it says they thrive within the intersections of race, caste, color, age, gender, sexual orientation, class, landlessness. So again, there was a, and uh, he was always mindful of economics and poverty and the roles that played in ethics and in how we treat each other, the ethics of caring. Um, ethnicity, nationality, language, and disability. So this was in 2001. What we know is that in the last five to 10 years, um, uh, with uh, some taking a little bit longer, uh, disability theology and disability ethics has really come into its own. But this is 2001, and it was just totally almost automatic that Tutu had paid attention to this, was including this in his considerations of, um, uh, of who, is, who is excluded in his tradition, who comprises the least of these that should be included in humanity's efforts to recognize and be more welcoming of all kinds of diversity. Also, um, uh, what uh, is not as well known perhaps is that Tutu was on the climate change, on the climate change and, and its, um, uh, its deleterious consequences quite early on. So um, here are pictures of uh, uh, former Vice President Gore and uh, Archbishop Tutu uh, talking uh, concerns about the climate and the environment uh, 14, 15 years ago. Now, um, in picking or in selecting, trying to pull out um, other kind of uh, themes uh, to think about today, because again, any any one that the, the the meaning and the history and the application of any of these slides, um, you you could write a dissertation on. But in reviewing um, the corpus of works available right now, um, both written by by Tutu. Um, and then starting to come out about him by people close to him. Um, there are a few themes that I want to note that um, have relevance to healthcare, the way we treat patients, the way we teach, the way, even if we're not in healthcare, the way we interact with students, families, each other, our colleagues. And one is um, known as um, Tutu's theology of Ubuntu. So Ubuntu actually is a stream of thinking in the African nations, um, most likely from South Africa, where Tutu was from. And it, it's described by Michael Battle, who um, is a theological uh, uh, professor, Episcopal priest, actually African-American, he's from the United States, but spent time uh, working with Tutu in South Africa. Um, he uh, describes Ubuntu as the freedoms of individuality and community that are so strong in African culture that you can't tell them apart. It means that human beings need each other to be human. Ubuntu provides an African worldview in which human and divine identity may find mutuality in concepts of community. So um, basically uh, what, what that means is that there is no I without we. That all things are about the community. An individual is only fully individual when they are totally in community. Um, this makes um, a fair amount of sense that um, Tutu 
would uh, have embraced Ubuntu as a key component of his overall world theological view for two for, for several reasons. But one is that it developed in um, the area of the world where he grew up. Um, also, um, uh, Tutu's family uh, valuing education, but also being poor at various times in his childhood and his adolescence, um, the children in his family would actually stay at some of the monastic communities um, uh, in the area, like during the week, because they happen to be closer to school, so it saved money on transportation, those kinds of things. And the especially the months when he was hospitalized with tuberculosis, uh, he was visited and uh, really influenced by several individuals who he calls his mentors uh, who were from monastic communities. And when Christian monasticism, as in probably other forms of monastic equivalents and other major world faith traditions, um, the idea is community, that the only way to really know God is that you see God in, and experience God, the divine, the transcendent in other people. Another area uh, that people may, again, I've touched on it, but that people um, I don't think fully realize or appreciate, but I would um, uh, commend has a wealth of really valuable um, information and inspiration for us as educators. And uh, uh, I know that almost uh, everyone probably listening um, today is uh, has a role in uh, education on some level and for many different, uh, different populations of students, as well as we are all perpetual students. Um, but Tutu, um, again, he was a teacher before he went to seminary. And during especially the first 10 to 15 years of his formal ministry uh, was actually deployed or assigned to sections of his home church, his home uh, faith organization uh, that dealt with not only theological education for those going into professional ministry, but also um, uh, those that educated people for uh, hospitals, those that um, uh, had authority or open, you know, kindergartens, uh, primary schools, secondary schools, et cetera. So the, one of the, the um, keys or some themes to Tutu's views on education. Um, he expressed when um, he addressed the Theological Education Fund in May of 1975, uh, that it was an outgrowth of the World Council of Churches, a huge organization for those of you not familiar with it. Um, in a way, it's kind of um, like a, a theological uh, uh, equivalent or uh, um, not exactly equivalent, but uh, if you can imagine what would the World Health Organization look like um, uh, for um, uh, different um, uh, faith organizations in many different countries, they got together and wanted to make like a United Nations or a United Theological uh, group of, um, of churches, theological organizations. Uh, he was in charge of the Theological Education Fund, and he said, our seminary graduates tend far too often for comfort, to be elitist, uncritical, conforming, and authoritarian. And so that statement right there, I've actually seen in the medical education literature as challenges or reminders of our responsibility, for instance, as, med as educators in, in medicine and graduate school. Um, we need to um, uh, be aware that um, there's a, a, a risk that as education increases, 
Uh, yes, it opens us up to new frontiers, but there's the risk that we can be perceived as being elitist or even authoritarian, kind of like, well, we we have these degrees, and so we must we must know best. Um, his two areas of concern um, as part of that uh, were number one, spirituality. And I won't go into a whole lot of detail about that right now, uh, because he, in this particular address and in years later, he um, immediately um, starts talking about Christianity and the role of the Christian church. Again, that's all important. A lot of it is applicable to um, uh, other faith traditions. Um, but suffice it to say that he saw um, education, ethical education, uh, needed to be rooted, let's say, in this values that uh, spirituality uh, can foster. But then also um, he was concerned that those in education maintain critical awareness. And here's what he said about critical awareness. Critical awareness, which has a passion and a reverence for truth and will not be cajoled or threatened to believe something to be true unless it recommends itself as the reasonable thing to conclude on the basis of the available evidence. So, you know, I had already graduated from medical school before evidence-based medicine started appearing in every, nearly every publication. And this was before that. So um, here we have um, a clergyman, uh, a theological educator, talking about evidence bases in 1975. It will make them ask awkward questions and not be merely conforming, and only thus can they ever hope to be creative. Only those ready to challenge the existing orthodoxes have ever advanced men's knowledge. And um, again, this is 1975. Uh, one of the things that's uh, kind of fun to uh, watch is over the years, uh, Tutu's own criticism of himself uh, for his um, lack of inclusive knowledge earlier in his career. Only those who have developed a passion for truth can ultimately be expected to become prophetic leaders, to speak out against unrighteousness and injustice and oppression without fear and favor. So in this quote, actually what you see, you know, it's directed, he's talking about it on an occasion that he has uh, where he's charged with talking about theological education or education in general. But as you can see, the core truths important to him um, pop up again and again, whether it's um, in his um, sermons, his writings, in his role as pastor, as archbishop, uh, whether it's in his addresses in small towns uh, where there have been riots, whether it's funeral addresses, um, whether it's ordinations, whether it's sitting on the stage with uh, world leaders and, for instance, trying to convince uh, Queen Elizabeth to uh, be as enthusiastic um, about a, a certain cause as what he is. I think, too, that if you have time to um, read some of his writings and what's written about him, uh, what, what is striking is his vision, his thought, and his embodiment of ethical leadership. Coming from his background, where even as he became better known to the world and a world traveler and had the world stage, it was very important for him to maintain his touch with commons, to see in his instance, in his words, to see God in everyone and everyone reflecting God back to him so that there was no hierarchy 
based on one's education, one's leadership roles, one's offices, uh, and one's income. So it's very important to him. You could not be a leader without also being a servant all the time and at the same time. And so here are some pictures that capture that kind of participation, that kind of um, involvement, um, being in the heart of the struggle. Uh, here he is at uh, an event um, on apartheid. Um, uh, this happened to take place in New York. You see him with a with a T-shirt on, uh, and he's right in the midst uh, of the crowd. And then you see him with people. Um, the uh, Bhutan uh, massacre um, was in South Africa in 1992. I think uh, over 40 individuals were killed, and um, he was invited um, to uh, do a, a communal um, uh, uh, funeral uh, service there. He was among the people, and the people loved him. Um, that was quite evident even uh, at the time of his, at, of his funeral, where uh, there were throngs in the street. His ethics were rooted in his belief in the goodness of God's creation. If we are fundamentally good, we simply need to rediscover this true nature and act accordingly. Um, one aspect of his theology that um, I think especially applies to some situations I've encountered in medical bedside ethics uh, and, and across medicine, actually, is in dire situations, lots of times it's in situations of utter devastation and of hopelessness. Uh, where someone gets a good idea and is inspired to either develop something or to say something helpful or come up with a new way, uh, a, a refined way to address an ethical issue. Um, I think that would have bothered Archbishop Tutu in that he preferred to not dwell in the devastation. By that, he didn't ignore it, but he focused his energy about, hey, we're, this is the rainbow, this is good, this is light. There is light in everyone. In this particular situation, how do we get from this point of darkness, of hopelessness, of evil, of death, of whatever medical uh, emergency we have, how do we get to where we want to be, where he would, in his words, where he would say, we are called to be love. We are called to be light. In all of his works, there is what you see is a strong, strong elements of virtue ethics and strong elements of feminist ethics. And these, you know, inform, um, his uh, diversity, equity, inclusion uh, approaches as well. So about his leadership style, his leadership was transformative. It was de definitely a form of servant leadership. It was inclusive. It was affirming of his coworkers. Um, and, and I think that's an important point uh, for us as, as ethics, ethicists and eth ethical con ethics consultants. How many times are we consulted or are there problems in our healthcare systems because of um, just workforce issues, uh, struggles, uh, differences of opinions, um, affirming coworkers uh, even um, uh, takes on new meaning now with COVID and with our levels of moral distress. Um, but it also had a very disciplined side to it, including prayer and meditation and real dedication to the task. His humor was always just below the surface. Um, Archbishop Tutu, I heard, uh, I actually heard him speak a few times uh, at DC 
uh, other DC events when we lived in um, in Alexandria. And he, the only way to describe his laugh was that he cackled. Um, it was a very distinctive laugh, and everyone worldwide talked about it. Uh, the that one of the the keys to his appeal to his being so beloved was his humor. His courage in dangerous times was legendary. He affirmed people, he encouraged them, but he also could make his points very firmly. Um, so also in ethics, and whether it's with families, with our coworkers during consultations, in our endeavors as educators, we can sometimes struggle to find that balance between being encouraging and being affirming and being a cheerleader. But yet there are times when one must say, hey, I see an issue here. This is a corrective stance or this is what I believe or this is what the evidence says needs to be done to get from this quagmire to a safe harbor. Uh, so what I've uh, tried to do here, um, and uh, it, it, again, it's uh, um, I, I'm just kind of at the at the start of trying to do some uh, internal integration of a lot of different things in in Tutu's writings, myself. Um, but uh, these are some of um, the books that are out. Uh, Tutu was so busy doing and ministering in a practical way that unlike many uh, theological leaders, um, there's not as large a corpus of written work. But I think over time now, you're going to see more and more people um, help us out with that as the, because they're going to remember his words. They're going to, I think, publish more correspondence. And those that knew and worked with him will be describing, um, bearing witness to what they experienced uh, his work to be like in, um, in person. And um, I've only started to scratch the surface in terms of the wide applicability of uh, uh, Tutu and his ethics uh, to the um, various ways that we can uh, uh, incorporate it into situations in bioethics. Um, I leave you uh, with this picture that, that I really love that um, I think encapsulates, encapsulates a lot of who he was. This is in St. George's uh, Cathedral. So this is like his the home seat of where um, uh, he was the archbishop for uh, in Cape Town. And so you see here the, um, the large stained glass windows that are symbolic of the organized church, the Anglican church. Um, uh, and then the choir dancing, celebrating, singing in, um, uh, again, in a traditional setting, but from the heart, from the country, uh, joyful. Uh, Tutu wanted to be remembered as being joyful and being forgiven. And here he is just erupting into spontaneous uh, dance and laughter. And that is one of the ways that he over and over again said that he wanted to be remembered. So thanks everyone for uh, taking time out of your day to, uh, to attend. And uh, uh, anytime um, you wanna email me and give me your thoughts, your feedback, um, I, uh, this, this is more of a, an ongoing discussion, I think. Thank you, Dr. Dell. Uh, I, we do have a few moments. If if people have questions that they wanted to ask, um, throw them in the chat or or um, raise your hand uh, uh, electronically.
question from Stanley Terman. Uh, what was his position on assisted suicide? Oh uh, yeah, um, um, that's one of those things. One, one of those little areas that's actually a big area. That's a whole again too. Um, basically, um, uh, as, as I'm aware, he was um, he was for it in terms of um, you know uh, for a number of he saw um, his thought was that again coming from his place of faith is that there are a lot worse things than death. And his vision of inclusivity and justice encapsulate or, or it incorporated um, dignity. And so I think that, that he made the jump from his Ubuntu theology, incorporating very uh, several of the Black liberation theologies, incorporating also his Anglican traditions. Again, he got his theological education in London. He actually uh, ministered to all white, at least one all white church in London as a priest. He made the jump then from that background to his work um, that, that occurred um, uh, in the in the state on the streets in terms of uh, how do you take liberation theology and God's the efforts to get uh, God's goodness appreciated and um, experienced by everyone in the apartheid area that led him to um, and this is my my take on the evolution time wise of his writings um, to really value and appreciate the dignity of everyone. And so I see that his um, his saying that uh, certain situations uh, of assisted uh, suicide are acceptable uh, as an extension of his uh, embracing dignity for all people. If you could follow that line of reasoning over the years. Uh, there was a follow up to that. Um, uh, people are, I think, are, are having to leave. It's one o'clock. Uh, before uh, we get too too far into that, I wanted to thank you uh, uh, for from the from both the the Williams lecture series and from the the program. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, for your presentation. Uh, if you have a few moments and people have further questions, uh, I'm happy to, to keep things going. Um, otherwise, uh, uh, you know, we thank you all for coming. Thank you. There was a there was a follow up question, which, uh, oh, oh, hang on, there's a, so was he committed to the work of interfaith dialogue and reconciliation between differing faith perspectives? Oh, yes, definitely. That was almost all that he was about. Um, he would say, my background, my belief is this. He actually, um, his family of origin, he was a Methodist, and then he uh, as he got to be a young adulthood, he spent some time in churches um, that were that were um, uh, more specifically black of black denominations. And then uh, his wife came from the Catholic tradition. He wound up an Anglican. Um, but his position was that there's there are common virtues, and um, God is God. Uh, and this is his expression of God. Other people may know God in different expressions, but we can all see God in all of us. So, of course, we should love each other, and of course, we should work together for these greater goods of human dignity, human rights, and equality. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Okay. Well, uh, thank you so much. I, I think I think uh, people have, have have left so many uh, uh, wonderful comments that uh, maybe you want to take a moment to read the chat. <laughs> uh, uh, it's uh, 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 thank you so much for for a wonderful talk, and and I think you've inspired many people today. Thank you for uh, uh, permitting me um, uh, uh, kind of a, a, a trial run on trying to uh, pull some of these thoughts together for myself. I appreciate it. And um, blessings to all of you in all of your work um, as you go back to your students and uh, to the people that you care for and care about. And thanks to Tulane to um, for um, uh, all the uh, graciousness that has been extended to me during my time in New Orleans. Thank you. And thank you everyone for attending. Um, please feel free to stay on our mailing list. We will let you know when the next uh, sessions occur. Thank you all. <laughs>